Get in the game with NFL Sunday Ticket from Rev TV. You'll get every game every Sunday afternoon from around the league. Plus, NFL Sunday Ticket gives you up to eight live games on one screen with Game Mix. You'll get that died and woke up in football heaven experience when you upgrade to NFL Sunday Ticket Deluxe, including Red Zone, the channel dedicated to every scoring play from every game. And if you add Rev TV HD to NFL Sunday Ticket Deluxe, you'll be able to win big weekly prizes with NFL Wildcard Mania. Get in the game with NFL Sunday Ticket. Homicide detectives on the hunt for 10 murder suspects. The education director addresses the issue of Haitian children in public schools. A cabinet minister insists government did not bail out Bank of the Bahamas. Plus, women encouraged to think pink. I'm Vonnie Tootin. We've got those stories coming up in NB12. Topping news tonight, as the murder count for 2014 nears triple digits, homicide detectives are on the hunt for 10 murder suspects, whom they say are wreaking havoc on the streets of New Providence. Authorities say at least two of those suspects are wanted for questioning in connection with multiple murders and shooting incidents in the Fox Hill and Montel Heights areas. We need to get some dangerous people off our streets in New Providence. Assistant Commissioner Stephen Dean says authorities will not rest until these 10 suspects are in police custody. At the top of their list, he says, is Jamal Aggie Gibson of Step Street. He's responsible for a number of murders, particularly in that Fox Hill area, the Bernard Road area, and also armed robberies. He is armed and dangerous. This is no person you want to have in your house, that you want to have in your company, that you want to be associated with. We believe if should we have him off the streets, it will reduce the murder count. Chief Superintendent of Police Paul Roll says authorities are also on the hunt for Dwight Jones, whom he says is wanted in connection with a recent murder and multiple shooting incidents. And I say to Dwight Jones, he can uh, save us the, the time and turn himself in. He's wanted for murder as well as there were a number of shooting incidents in the Montel Heights area that, that we need to speak to him on. Roll says police also need your help finding Carson Farrington, Stanley Taylor, Sherrod Curry, 25-year-old Gibson Baptiste, Jermaine Scott and Prince Swiper Farrington who lives in the Tall Pines area. Uh, we appeal to Persons, you, family members as well, you're hearing us. Um, help your, your loved ones to come in and answer to these um, uh, allegations that are being made against them. And uh, we don't want to see any more further bloodshed. Dean warned relatives and friends of the dangers of harboring wanted suspects. Please do not cloak these persons. We need them in custody. They cannot be sleeping in your house and the police have them on the most wanted list. It's a criminal offense who have our persons who are wanted fugitives in our country. Chief Superintendent Roll says police are also searching for a third suspect in the murder of 44-year-old Andre Cartwright, who was shot dead during a home invasion in the Blair Estates community last week. 99 people have been murdered in the Bahamas so far this year. According to Nassau Guardian records, 90 murders were recorded between January 1st and November 3rd, 2013. National Security Minister Dr. Bernard Nottage announced last week that government has developed new crime-fighting strategies to address what he called the recent spike in certain types of criminal activity. Like Nottage, Dean would not give details, only saying hundreds of officers are on the streets and a lot of things are happening. If we see an increase in a particular area, we know that we have to channel more resources in that area. So we are doing police controls, we taking a series, because this is coming now to the end of the year. We know it's the Christmas season. We know it's going to be a busy time for the holidays. So all stocks are on the road. Everybody has relieved themselves of their offices in the RBPF. Everybody on the streets now. 
Days after a U.S. Embassy crime advisory alleged that an American citizen who lives in the Bahamas was kidnapped and violently raped while walking home, police press liaison officer Stephen Dean suggested that he has nothing to hide and it all comes down to credibility. When asked if police received reports of the alleged rape and kidnapping, Dean said he releases the information they receive. It will come in the crime report. It will come in the crime report. What you see us report, we report incidents where persons are molested. So you have no knowledge of someone No, I'm, 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 what, what I will say to you is that you all get the press release in the morning times, you all can scan them, and you all can make your assessment based on that. I am responsible for the press release. Um, it depends on you determine whether my credibility is on the line or not. I can tell you I release what we have. In its latest crime advisory, the U.S. Embassy in Nassau said in October, a U.S. citizen who resides in the Bahamas was kidnapped and violently raped while walking home. Additionally, at least three Americans, including a minor, were allegedly sexually assaulted by jet ski operators on Paradise Island, according to the statement. However, there were no reports to the media that Americans were sexually assaulted by jet ski operators, nor was there any report that an American was violently raped. Dean would not comment on allegations involving jet ski operators, insisting the Bahamian government should respond to those claims. Because of the nature of where the information is coming from, we'll want our government to speak to that. And so you'll find out that they will speak from government to government, right? So the police would not be, able to, to be the spokesperson for that type of international matter. Education Director Lionel Sands made it clear today that all children in the Bahamas have a right to attend school, whether they are here legally or illegally. His comments come one day after a Haitian community leader told MB12 that Haitian parents are afraid to send their children to school now that government's new immigration policy is in effect. Simone Davis reports. After Shantytown residents expressed concerns to NB12 about allowing their children to attend schools, Sands assured them not to be afraid because it is the child's right to learn regardless of their nationality. Sands said the Bahamas is associated with international conventions and one in particular called the Rights of Children, which emphasized that school-aged children in the country should be allowed to attend school until they are either repatriated or decide to return to their homeland. Well, the Bahamas is a party to many conventions, international conventions. And one of those conventions um, stressed that any school-aged child in the country um, should be allowed to attend school. And of course, th the only exemption to this would be those children who come into the country with the non-immigrant visas, visitors' visa, sorry. Mm -hmm. And so those ones they are not allowed to attend school because they're expected to go back at the end of their visit. But any other children who are of school age should be allowed in school until such time as they are either repatriated back to their homeland or um, they return back to their homeland. San said when a child is enrolled into the school system, certain documents like their immunization cards are required, but their nationality and the nationality of their parents are not. When we, when we take registration, the, the thing that we do is we ask, number one, for the um, immunization card to ensure that they immunize against any disease that may be, uh, you know, spread in the country. And so that's one of the requirements for entry into our schools. But uh, we don't ask them if their parents are here legally or illegally. We don't do that. That's, that's an immigration problem and so immigration would deal with that. We, we just deal with having the children registered to attend school for whatever the duration is that they are, they are here for. He noted that although their nationality is not required, proof of identification is important to avoid imposters. He said he has no concerns about illegal immigrants being allowed to attend schools because he believes that educating everyone in the country will benefit Bahamian communities. In terms of, in terms of uh, verifying that the children are who they're presented to be, uh, we do ask for documentation. And so that's, that's a requirement because we, we do not want children coming into the school using an identity that's not theirs. And so we do ask for documentation. But we do not ask for um, documentation to show that the parents are here legally or illegally. The truth of the matter is when you, when you, 
whether children here legally or illegally, when you educate children, you're making um, way for a better community. However, Sands revealed that by allowing illegal immigrants in schools, the government is then forced to pay a heavy price because education is expensive in the Bahamas. Every child that attends school, the government pays a hefty price for. When you look at the, the budget for education alone, Department of Education, you're talking about over $200 million per year. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you divide the $200 million per year into 50,000 children, 51,000 children, you, you're spending some money. And so in that sense, yes, there's concern because we're spending so much money. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't even speak to the health services or the other services. He said the main goal of the Ministry of Education is to ensure that those who are living in the country illegally are educated and able to function properly until they're either repatriated or gain legal citizenship. Reporting for NB12, I'm Simone Davis. There is more to the Bank of the Bahamas bailout than you think. That's according to Free National Movement Chairman Darren Cash. Kyle Joaquin explains. There appears to be more coming out of the BOB bailout ordeal today. There are some like FNM Chairman Darren Cash, who is also an accountant by trade, who feels there should be someone held responsible for what he calls poor financial management at BOB, which eventually forced the government to intervene. On Friday, government announced the creation of Resolve Bahamas, the corporation designed to strengthen the Bank of the Bahamas. In that bailout, $65 million in government deposits are being used to prop up the bank. Prime Minister Christie, during the announcement, placed some of the blame on the previous economic recession. However, two other banks, Commonwealth Bank and Fidelity, faced the same recession and were able to avoid exposing themselves to bad commercial debt at the same levels that harmed the Bank of the Bahamas. BOB's credit committee approved these commercial loans, which then turned out to be problematic, and their poor decisions totaled one-third of the bank's loan portfolio. To further break it down for you, the Central Bank of the Bahamas requires that banks maintain capital levels of at least 11.7 percent. BOB's Tier 1 capital ratio, however, fell to 3.8 percent. Cass believes Prime Minister Christie should follow the example of some American companies after the government bailed them out. To make the case to the Bahamian people that contrary to what the big full-page ads have said, things will not be business as usual. Mr. Christie has to act to renew this board, to renew the senior leadership team, and to give the Bahamian people and the shareholders of Bank of the Bahamas a very clear sense that things will not be business as usual. Now, it was stressed by BOB's managing director, Paul McQueenie, that those commercial loans were not politically connected. However, Cash insists some of those commercial loans are tied to members of the PLP. While the businesses that continue to get funding, and we don't know the ownership of all of those businesses, there are significant concerns about a high level of insider trading involving, um, well, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Um, that ought to get investigated. But these business people, these special interests, including senior leadership, senior leaders of the Progressive Liberal Party, who have benefited from Bank of the Bahamas loans, they were able to get their money and, and walk away. Meanwhile, the Bahamian people are left with the tab. When asked on Monday how he thinks the international finance arena would view this bailout, Financial Services Minister Ryan Pinder said this was no bailout. Instead, he called it support. Here was his definition of a bailout. A bailout um, is really what the United States authorities did with their banks when they actually transfer cash to the bank. Um, that was not done at the Bank of the Bahamas. Um, the government took certain non-performing loans um, into a private sector um, special purpose vehicle um, in order to be able to manage the collection of those loans and give um, relief to the balance sheet of the Bank of the Bahamas. And in turn, the government um, will pay a promissory note for that. Um, that's not a bailout. However, Cash said for someone with such an extensive finance background, Pinder should be straight up and call it as it is. A bailout, a lifeline, a rescue mission is by any measure what it is. They're putting $65 million in, and the Bahamian people are, after they take $100 million of bad debts out, are still on the hook for those losses. 
Cash says in the case of B.O.B., there are simply way more questions than answers. Reporting for NB12, I'm Kyle Joaquin. When NB12 returns, find out why some FNM supporters are incensed by their leader's campaign ad. The details are after this break.